is Move the Needle with Rob Kaplan, where we talk to people who lead, innovate, and inspire. So what was the cost of more notoriety, higher profile? The cost is, you know, it puts pressure on the, on the culture, ethos, you know, standard, the, the why we serve. Today on Move the Needle, Rob talks with retired Navy Admiral Wyman Howard, who led the Navy SEALs through an amazing era of growth and change. But perhaps his biggest challenge was public awareness of the SEALs post 9-11. I met Wyman Howard several years ago. We were introduced through mutual friends. At the time, he was a special forces commander. I was a professor at Harvard Business School. He was particularly interested in leadership lessons that I had learned while being a professor and in my business career. And over the years I got to know him, he had me come and speak at Fort Bragg and regularly talk to me about some of the leadership challenges he was facing. Wyman is, uh, is one of the great military leaders and unsung heroes in our military that we've had over the last few decades. Wyman, I'm very glad to have you with us today. Thank you, Rob. In 1990, you joined the Navy. And I know you did it with a view that you were going to be in the Navy SEALs and in the Special Forces. Well, I don't recall choosing the Navy. The first song I remember hmm. uh, hearing and learning was the Navy, the Naval Academy fight song, The Goat is Old and Gnarly, that my father would sing to me uh, as, a, as a young boy. Everything that I did in, as a young man in, in, in high school was boresighted on the Naval Academy and uh, joining uh, the SEAL teams. Uh, from Boy Scouts to competitive rowing, that was the trajectory. I applied to one school with no plan B. And my family had, had served in the Navy really without a break in service since the 1800s. Once in the Navy, I did choose to stay at several inflection points, and that was driven by three factors. The deeply steeped in purpose mission of the SEAL teams, of Naval Special Warfare, of serving with my joint teammates, the standard that we chose to serve, and the opportunity to, to solve the hardest problems. The arc of my career is an interesting one because it, it began in what I term as the third modern era of, of special operations, and this is 80s into the, the 90s. And it was an era of very low combat employment, operational tempo, and it's an era of when I taught a class in Naval Special Warfare, I anchored on because we were raised by a generation of stewards, you know, humble stewards that in many cases, they were employed not on even one combat operation over an entire career. Hmm. They, they left the fighting posi uh, position better uh, because of their service, their leadership. And they raised our generation and got us ready for what happened after 9-11. After and just to stop on that for a moment, so the non-combat period would have been at the close of the Vietnam War until through the, know, the Gulf War? Yeah, through, through, really through the 90s. You had the Gulf War before that. You had contingency missions in the Western Hemisphere, Grenada, Panama. The operational tempo did not match what was to come. That's the point. Right, right. And the, the level of uh, penetration of combat experience in the force was very, very low. But you had a generation that stayed on the account. They left the fighting position better. They raised us. And they were the bridge of the lessons in terms of tactics, techniques, and procedures, culture, standard from Vietnam that was built before that in World War II in Korea with the frogmen, underwater demolition teams. They were that bridge that, that put us in position after 9-11. The last 20 years have been that, that fourth era, you know, high, uh, high operational tempo, that in many cases was not distinctive to us, but required scale uh, given the policy choices that were that were made by our civilian leadership. And just to be clear, what marked that was the second, for lack of a better term, the second Gulf War, where went into first Afghanistan, then went into Iraq, and for the twenty years plus or minus after that, that was this high intensity period you're referring to. That's right. That's this fourth era. And we're entering the fifth era, the fifth modern era. I say modern 
is these irregular approaches, irregular warfare, it's not new to mankind. Uh, so we don't, we don't want to stand on that like we're inventing something. But the, this fifth era is what I led through my last tour to be ready for what's ahead you know, with urgency because we don't know how much time we have. And it's, it's uh, a, a focus on nuclear peer adversaries. It's a focus on irregular deterrence options that increase leverage for our national leadership, put more chess pieces on the board for the president to deter irregularly our adversaries and de-escalate the crisis. This is the distinctive opportunity for naval special warfare. And this is the, again, a private sector term, the addressable market that we pointed towards. We oriented our entire enterprise for the last two years. And to be clear about this, this is more about deterrence and very quiet operations, not active combat operations, but it's uh, deterrence around the world that uh, may not be part of a formal combat operation. It's deterrence of conflict. And mm-hmm. if you think about deterrence, we conventionally deter our adversaries with conventional mil- military capability. I mean, deterrence is whole of government. It's economic, informational, diplomatic, national power. You know, the military contribution to that is important, but I would argue not decisive. There's an emerging third pillar of deterrence that I've seen clearly. Uh, I've termed it irregular deterrence. It gets into cognitive influence of your adversaries to undermine their confidence. Mm-hmm. So that they can achieve their political objectives through military violence that could be very destabilizing. And it also includes the ability to credibly hold your adversary systems at risk. This is where I pointed Naval Special Warfare, our team, where we enrolled on the opportunity. And then we went to work across assessment selection, capabilities, task organization, and new command and control concepts to, as I said, put more chess pieces on the board for the president to credibly deter our adversaries. And systems means computer systems, other operational systems, so a lot more technology intervention? Really, there's four four principal systems, transportation, communications, space, and energy. Those are the systems. And it's an imperative that our country uh, to credibly deter attacks on our systems, you know, that we hold at risk our adversary systems. That's my point of view. Got it. Uh, that's what we oriented on sure. as an opportunity that's distinctive to naval special warfare. And that may be more intellectual combat than physical combat. Certainly on the cognitive side. And I think Joint Special Operations, Special, you know, special Operations Command, uh, with all of its capabilities and very distinctive capabilities within our Army special operations teammates, that is absolutely an area of focus, you know, focus within the government in support of, of the State Department and other, other elements of the government. But I assume, therefore, the training processes, recruiting, development of, of your talent is dramatically different than it might have been 20, 25 years ago? Well, it's starting to shift. You know, the standard for our assessment selection, the cognitive character and leadership attributes that we assess and select for, there's a consistency to those standards. But your assessment and selection must always evolve. And over the last two years, to your point, out of whole cloth, we built a new assessment command. What you're describing and your role sounds more like, uh, to me, a CEO that's trying to decide how to develop a strategy, what you do that's distinctive, developing priorities, aligning your priorities to every aspect of what you're doing. It's This is a very broad job that you're talking about in your final uh, assignments over the last several years. Naval Special Warfare is a multi-billion dollar CapEx, OpEx entity. You know, the returns are the national security outcome. You started in 1990 when you got when you joined the SEAL team How long was your training, and then what was the first team you joined, and what was the nature, just generally the nature of the assignments for the next several years? My first command was SEAL Team 8, and then I had the opportunity to go to SEAL Team 1, which is really important geographically. It's in the Pacific. Uh, We have three SEAL delivery vehicle teams for undersea missions, uh, two special reconnaissance teams, and three special boat teams for surface mobility. The aggregate of that is the failings of the of the enterprise. It's the operational capability. 
Equally critical is are the teammates who support warfighting functions. That includes intelligence, communications, logistics, sustainment, cyber, electronic warfare. And it's that part of the enterprise that distinguishes Naval Special Warfare. And it's a place we've invested heavily over the last 20 years and where we culturally affirmed the mission criticality of inclusive teams to solve hard problems. And I'd say where we don't confuse your value with how close you get to the objective. Tell us what the physical test is and the what the dropout rate is and how, how much physical ability, strength, endurance, swimming capability do I need to have? There are standards across uh, all the things you mentioned, you know, the st- uh, minimum standards. And those standards have been validated by by the Navy and by, by a third party. And when we opened Naval Special Warfare to women candidates many years ago, it was important to be precise in what those standards are uh, indexed against real missions. And so that work has been done. But I want to emphasize the grit, the resilience, the problem solving, the creativity, the fluidity, integrity, judgment. Uh, are you a good follower, teammate? mentor. Those are the those are the attributes that we are assessing. How many SEAL team applicants are you getting every year and how many, what percentage of them make it to become a SEAL team, SEAL team member? Yeah, we bring in, a, uh, let's say, a, a, you know, a few uh, thousand candidates. You know, it's, it's a big funnel you know, that, that walks down to uh, a number that uh, can sustain the force. And I think where we saw opportunity with the assessment command in 2020 and, and invested in this, in this uh, command with our best SEALs, our objective there was to deliver smaller cohorts with higher instructor cadre to candidate ratio and have lower attrition. Harvard Business School, where, as you know, I was a professor, you know, let's take it one out of every 12 applicants gets in. Uh, if the SEAL team is the, are the odds better than that? Worse than that? That sounds about, no, it's, it's, it's a bit better than that, but okay. the, it's you know, those that, those that don't make it. Yeah. And one of the things we uh, did while I was the commander is rebrand, reimagine how we transition those teammates to to the Navy. Right. Um, we, you don't we, want to lose them. Well, they're, they're incredible. Uh, it's incredible talent. And, right. And, the, and the, the first thing I directed is, is that we, we really celebrate the attribute that they have demonstrated, and it's the, the risk of failure. Right. The guts to try. Right. Because right. that attribute alone will carry them to, to success. What I'm most proud of is how our team, our families, how we together led through a mass casualty, you know, the very tragic loss uh, on 6 August 2011, where we, you know, we suffered a, a very significant combat loss. Deborah, at this point, the U.S. military is absolutely reeling at the news. Uh, several U.S. government officials now tell CNN that the majority of those killed in this incident are believed to be U.S. Navy SEALs. That's U.S. Navy Special Forces, the very types of troops that, of course, conducted that raid against Osama bin Laden. One official saying this is a big loss for the U.S. Navy. And I remember meeting President Obama in Dover, and I was introduced to him as the next commander of this unit. And it's this long handshake. And the president looked at me and he said, be ready, I'm going to call on you again. Hmm. We're still shaking hands. And the only thing that came to mind, the only thing I've ever said directly to the president of the United States, I looked at him and I said, of course, Mr. President. And he let go of my hand and walked off. He kind of he nodded and, and then walked off. Hmm. And uh, five months later, six months later, you know, the call came for a mission that only the president has the authorities, approvals, and permissions. They reside with him alone. 
I was at my son's basketball game and we were called into work um, with the team, a team that has trust and confidence and grit. And, and you know, part of the story is we had, uh, we had failed a similar mission and the failure was a result of our unit's own actions on the objective. And you know, that was maybe a year before this. And there was unit and individual accountability, you know, learn fast and always forward. Uh, this is now five months after our, uh, this, this very tragic loss, and he did call. And so we came into work, made a plan, briefed our civilian, le- civilian senior civilian and military leadership, launched from the United States. This is the joint story. I mean, there are Marine capabilities, Army capabilities, Air Force capabilities, Navy capabilities, space capabilities. Mm. And, and from the time we left the United States to mission complete was less than 72 hours. And we executed the mission. We conducted the mission on the State of the Union. So think political, strategic mm. risk. And then we were home Friday night, and I was at my son's basketball game the ne- very next Saturday, which was a... a an unbelievable bookend mm-hmm. on the other side of the earth. You know, that's, right. It's like a 16,000 mile round trip. As a Navy commander, um, Wyman had to deal with a whole range of leadership issues, management issues, what I would call alignment issues. Uh, and in particular, he had to focus on what the Navy SEALs did and Special Forces did that was distinctive. So in the military, as in business, the leader plays a key role, but the leader needs to work through either hundreds or thousands of other people. And because of that, the leaders got to think very much about clear expectations, about having the right people in the right seats. So there's a lot of analogies between business and the military, and Wyman was very interested in trying to understand those analogies. So we spent two years uh, running at that hard, and we were successful. We changed as we changed everything: task organization, command and control, assessment selection. Uh, we were very successful in gaining more resources. We had a significant budget growth to to develop the manned and unmanned capabilities that extend reach, proximity reach to our adversaries. Uh, and in that role as CEO, as you said before, as commander. It's a quest for perfect knowledge of your enterprise. It's the fingertip feel. And I uh, trained for a few months. I hadn't done a lock-in, lock-out. That's where you insert and then extract from and back to a a nuclear submarine. And I I hadn't experienced that myself since I was Ensign Howard off Puerto Rico on a Sturgeon-class submarine, which we don't even have anymore. In 1991, and you know, lead by example, fingertip feel, understand risk, understand complexity, flat team to solve hard problems. So I trained for a few months to experience that myself as you know in this role. It was an incredible opportunity to to just see the the complexities and risks that our that our team takes on for the most strategic missions that the nation asks of us. Wyman, tell me a little bit about who your role models and heroes were, people that helped motivate you. Well, my father, absolutely. He was a 30-year naval officer. His impact on my leadership and ability to lead change was profound. My mother, you know, grace and uh, respect, coaches, my English teacher, Pat Welsh, he wrote for the Washington Post. In the Outlook section, absolutely 
phenomenal uh, servant. He taught at T.C. Williams for 30 plus years, the impact over multiple generations of so significant critical thinking, love of literature. But ultimately, my heroes are my fallen teammates and the Gold Star families. It's our Gold Star families that inspire you know, our force. It's their, you know, their grace and commitment and sacrifice. Their leadership is important to our team, to our mission. All those that seek the rock quarry, that do the work and, and serve in, in some way, and it's not necessarily in government. In their local communities, it's volunteering, you know, do the hard work, and you know, with humility and stewardship. What do you think of leaders who take credit but don't give credit? One of the things we emphasize in our force is to deflect the credit. Anything we're doing, there's some critical piece that lays outside of our, of our enterprise. Remember I said, don't confuse your value. Don't correlate value with proximity to the objective. It's communications, intelligence, logistics. To set the table like that culturally on a team is very, very powerful. You know, that's what we strive to do. It's not perfect. You got to take a steady strain on that one. When you're asked to take on missions of the complexity and risks that, you know, that we often do, the critical pieces lay in so many different places. But then when you fail, that's different. Then, then you, you own that one. What do you do with people who make mistakes? Well, you develop them. We have a great example of that. When I was the commander of development group, we had a group of teammates that, that made a mistake. You know, they were held accountable, but they were also developed. And you can go across each one of those teammates and trace the arc of their contributions after. And it's an incredible story, Rob, of uh, accountability, but, but development. Humility sharpened for us in, in loss, you know, combat loss. You know, we touched on you know, the, the missions that, that you're not successful. And then I think imperfection, right? Human imperfection. It's learn fast, turn the page, always forward. You'll know, find ways to develop teammates that, that make a mistake. I mean, that's, that's, that's got to be your first, you know, your first move. You know, when I reflect on, on a mistake. Yes. I think about not seeing clearly, you know, around the corner yeah. to identify the accumulation of exposure, to see the, the threshold of fame that we would cross in, in 2011 and the market that would create and the challenges we would face to our culture, our ethos, you know, in our 2011 standard. 2011 being bin Laden. The 2011 was a very active year. There's a number of things that happened. Right. There. Got it. But there, there, there's a... a we stepped across a threshold there. I don't think we, we, we didn't see it clearly. So what was the cost of more notoriety, higher profile? The cost is, you know, it puts pressure on the, on the culture, ethos, you know, standard, the, the why we serve. Uh, and those challenges, you know, that, that we faced after that, you know, were really amplified by decisions, you know, in the mid to late 2000s. As, as the community, as Naval Special Warfare was seeking to grow to meet counterterrorism demand, yeah, you know, there were some decisions to uh, reach more candidates and increase the visibility of, of the command. You know, those were yeah. those were leadership decisions. Yeah, and, and that you know that undermined the foundation. Of, I would not say it, it weakened the foundation of our ethos. And so, fast forward to 2011, you know, I think we you know, we have worked very hard to and advanced in, in the ways, you know, how we've adapted you know, through professional development, education, enforcing standards, correcting deviations that are in our control. I talked about in 2020, the new assessment command. And, you know, part of that is setting expectations. Yep. The expectation of serving in, in SEAL team is to take on the hardest problems, solve the hardest problems. And I gather what's implicit in that is taking risk. If it's hard, it means there's risk. Right. Imperfection. Absolutely. Thin margins. Uh, yeah. The highest complexity, highest risk missions, the hardest so, problems. That's what we're, that's, that's the main thing. What do you do with someone who, for whatever reason, uh, is, has a blind spot, doesn't have an accurate self-perception, you just can't get through to? Well, it's, it's the candid feedback for self, self-improvement, self-correction, right? Reflection. Yeah. 
yeah. self-correction, self-improvement. And, and we have a significant investment in a essentially a 360 tool yeah at all the at all the friction points in a oper- in assessment selection and in an operational readiness cycle a way of providing you know superior peer and subordinate candid anonymous assessments of your tactical competence leadership and character it's an incredible platform that's it's, effective it, it's it, it is and it's how you correct for variance in any organization so yeah. it's a place that we're really leading and have worked with the Navy to expose the Navy to, to this uh, approach you know, that, that's scalable. Yeah, I like it. This week, Rob spoke with retired Navy Rear Admiral Wyman Howard, who commanded the Navy Special Warfare Command for two years. Next time on Move the Needle with Rob Kaplan. I've been more focused on trying to, to work on the whole system versus to create uh, more and more lifeboats, if you will, because that's what vouchers are, that's what charters are, and, and that may be great for those kids, but at the end of the day, you still have a mass amount of kids left back in the system. Move the Needle with Rob Kaplan is produced and edited by Sam Zeff and Scott Richardson, and I'm executive producer, Ronell Golden. We want to thank Michelle Brown, as well as Zorik and his team from Hello Studios for logistical and technical support. Make sure not to miss an episode by subscribing to Move the Needle on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and the Robert Stephen Kaplan YouTube channel.